So the seven C's are not only going to help your clients, it's only going to also going to help you help your clients achieve more than just their money. So stick around, join us for an incredible episode today. And uh, today I'm talking to Rob McDonald. Good morning, good morning. I hope you have a coffee, although it's very hot this early in the morning already, So, and I'm on my way to Pretoria, so that's going to be a very interesting day. I know uh, Pretoria is much hotter than uh, Johannesburg usually, but a warm good morning. Thank you very much for joining us live, and if you're watching the recording of today's episode, you're in for a real treat, so thank you for being here, and uh, enjoy all of the amazing content we've got for you today. And uh, I'm really joined by uh, all the great hosts and uh, segments and everything today. And then I've got a very special guest, as I mentioned, right in the intro, uh, Rob McDonald. So today we're going to talk all about uh, sort of Rob's new book, uh, which is very interesting. It's called uh, Seven Pillars of uh, Financial Health. And uh, it's a really powerful book. Uh, I haven't managed to get far through it. I only got a copy on Wednesday night. So, uh, But it's been very interesting so far. And it's really a great read. And I was privileged to be at the uh, book launch here in Johannesburg on Wednesday night. And just to hear why Rob has been doing this and sort of what he's trying to achieve with this has been really inspiring to me. So very happy that I have him here today. I didn't know that I was going to the book launch when we set up today's uh, interview. So really looking forward to that. But as uh, usual, I am not alone this morning. I'm joined by Lalani Bezaydenot. Uh, so she's in the house this morning to share all the current affairs uh, about the profession with us. Then we also have Norma uh, that's here. So uh, we're looking forward to her segment. And then also Gugu is back with Wired to Connect. And uh, she's got a special guest again this morning. So going to talk all about uh, some interesting stuff around niching. So looking forward to that. Then I've got a couple of announcements. Luckily, as the year runs out, the announcements are getting less. So uh, <laughs> for now, but we have loads of things up our sleeves for next year. Um, and then uh, lastly, we'll uh, I'll chat to Rob this morning. So thank you very much. Uh, if you're here, do say hi in the chat. Uh, one of the big things is that uh, if you want to help us get the word out and let more people know about the show, I was just saying in the intro that uh, next year will be season five. And uh, it's just incredible to think of this. <laughs> it's been four years that we've been doing this. It feels like uh, we started yesterday. So anyway, brilliant stuff. Um, do say hi in the chat. Uh, please hit the like button. It's a little one that looks like this. Uh, if you're not sure, uh, if you're on your mobile app, there's just a little uh, thumbs up that you can click. If you're on your desktop or laptop, please click it. You can even do it on your television. I know a couple of you are watching this on your TV. So uh, do do that. It helps quite a bit to let everybody know this is valuable. Anyway, so first in the house from the banks of the Vol River, we have Quibus Klein. Good morning, Quibus. Warm welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, all the way from wherever you are uh, always. Uh, Albert Huemora, I'll be seeing you later at Connect. Terence, good morning. So good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, thank goodness it's Friday. And uh, yeah, so uh, welcome to that. I said good morning already there. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just clicking without reading. Kevin, good morning. I uh, hope it's going well in your part of the world. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. I see you and Russell met up uh, in the week, which is absolutely incredible. Again, two people from opposite sides of the world uh, connect virtually, uh, share a passion, and then get together when they have the chance is absolutely what, what everything is about. Stephen, good morning. Nice to see you as well. Welcome, Mr. Mark Weston Ford. Good morning. Nice to see you. Ferdi, goeiemorgen. Good morning. Johan Basson, goeiemorgen. Uh, happy rest. And uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I saw a Ferry. Lekker man. Uh, lekker for you. So everybody can say happy birthday. Johan, goeiemorgen. Good morning. Welcome. Johan Potgieter. Johan Blumeres. Jeez, all the Johans are in the house this morning. Uh, it's absolutely uh, busyness. So David, good morning. Nice to see you. Francis, goeiemorgen. Good morning. Tines, goeiemorgen. Uh, warm welcome. Uh, nice to see you all. We have Grant Newland Nell in the house. Good morning, Grant. I've got Adrian and uh, Harry Nell. Good morning. Michelle, good morning. Jeez, we are busy this morning. Neil, good morning. <laughs> nice to see you. Kavendra. And uh, there we go. All righty, before <laughs> we get even busier, it's just incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, he has current affairs with Lelani Besaida, right? <music> Yeah. 
Yes, good morning, Francia and team. It's wonderful to be online with you in the sunny day in South Africa. Francia, I remember season one, episode one. Um, it was during lockdown. I think it was on a Saturday, if I recall correctly, and I was sitting in my garden in the sun listening to the very first episode. So congratulations, um, and I pray that you are blessed with even another 100 sessions because this is really seasons, because it's really great. Um, yes, the song in my head this morning, it's the final countdown. Yes, it's convention. Unfortunately, registrations has closed down and we are extremely excited about the FPI convention that is happening next week. Thank you for everybody that will be joining us as well. But on to current affairs. So if you don't know who the Nova Property Group is, well, they are formally known as the ShareMax Group. Um, so they are facing some financial distress surprise uh, and they cannot fill the obligations towards the debenture holders. So if you remember correctly with ShareMax, it's people holding debentures and unlisted shares. So recent annual financial statements showed significant losses for the Nova Group, cash flow challenges and a reduced property portfolio. Yet, you know, you have the people on the board, Connie Myberg and the CEO, Dominique, who feels that, uh, you know, the company is in a sound financial, financial position. And this is, you know, in the face of a financial loss of about 50 million and a cash balance of only 4.4 million. Um, then, so of course, you know, the, the, the uncertainty here is the debenture holders who would still not uh, getting paid. And then the board who's Connie and Dominique postponed the debenture repayment beyond a specified 10 year period. And the audited financial statement suggests that it may take more than, you know, those 10 years to address. So Nova's financial challenges and the uncertainties surrounding the ability to meet obligations raises significant questions about the future and of course the poor investors um, who's left quite poor quite frankly after they've decided to invest with ShareMax. Then something else that's quite all over the news is the BHI Trust. Um, if you haven't heard about it well you should have and funny enough it stands for Berkshire Hathaway Investments. Now that is not Warren Buffett's company and a Warren's company, on the other hand, is an American multi company um, with its headquarters in the US, of course. And the main business of his company is around um, insurance. Um, capital um, in insurance from which it invests the float into a broad portfolio of subsidiaries. Um, so Warren Buffett, I nearly said Ingram, Warren Buffett has been the CEO of that company since 1965. So it's not that Berkshire Hathaway. If you look at the BHI um, Trust in South Africa, they're also known as the BHI Holdings. So the other day, Francia, very quickly, I was on a call with Maya Fisher French, and I said, you know what, online, let's just see what we find with intent minutes around this company and I still have my original notes here quickly. So if we quickly go to the World Wide Web, what is the first thing you find when you go BHI Trust? Well, you discover a person called Craig Warina. And then the first thing you find is a government gazette still for 50 cents in 1988. Um, and that was Craig Warren Investment Trust. Now, you won't find Craig Warren Investment Trust or BHI Holdings on the FES, uh, FECA's website because they're not registered. So all I then did is I went to the BIS portal, which is open to anybody in the public, including but not limited to financial advisors. And I found two companies there. Then I looked at the address. The first thing you then do is to go and see, but is that a real place? Because to be a financial services provider or to provide any financial services, you need to have operational ability. Now, I remember when I looked at the share my cases back then, there was somebody who provided advice. Sometimes there's something in the name. And the person's name was Deep Risk. And I thought, hmm, in the name. Then if you look at BHI Trust, the address is for Gremlin Road. Hmm. Okay, so look at it. There is a building, and as you put the address into Google to have a look, my goodness, there is so many different investments registered to that exact same property. Now, I'm not going to mention the names because they're not necessarily involved, but if you go Google the address, you'll find a little look investments with a telephone number, and if you phone them, they <laughs> true caller shows one company's name. Then it says, welcome to Planners Perspective, a KP fiduciary solutions business. So that is true caller. And it's literally when you phone that number. So just by looking at that, um, you know, the phone numbers, the various places that's registered to that same address. And it's also then linked, if you look at the um, Craig Warriner Investment CC, 
the members of that closed corporation, there's one member there that's not Craig. And if you then further on go down, you'll find that there's a foundation. And as you open the foundation's documents, you'll find that that member of that CC is part of the, the, the foundation plus a lot of uh, reverence and, and duemonies. So have a round, you know, have a scoot around. Hello, Peter. So just in 10 minutes, this is what Maya and I could find. So the question is, would the reasonable financial advisor have been able to find enough information in the World Wide Web? Yes, they would have. And alarm bells should have gone off to say, hmm, maybe this is not the right investment for my client. And they should have phoned the then FSB or the now conduct authority to say, you know what, these oaks are not registered, please investigate them. So I can go on forever and ever, but I'm over my five minutes already. So Francois, thank you so much for this morning uh, and have a fantastic day and I'll see everybody at the conference. Blessings. Goodbye. <music>Thank you very much, Lalani. Yeah, it's uh, crazy, these things, right? We sort of innately trust uh, a lot of these because they look very legit. And then uh, we really need to do our homework uh, and be sure that we don't get involved with the wrong people and the wrong businesses. So very important, right? Next up is Norma. And uh, today, Norma has a very important topic for us uh, around sort of how we can navigate the end of the year, you know. And uh, I know last week we, we spoke a bit about uh, why we overindulge sometimes and those kind of things. And today she builds on that with some more insights. Good morning. Uh, excited to be back and uh, have a brand new topic for you. So yes, we're building on last week and seeing that we're approaching the end of the year and the festive season is just around the corner. What normally goes with that is consumption. And sadly to say that we sometimes overconsume. So I don't know if you've been in that situation where you got to January and you look back and you have a little bit of regret or maybe some guilt or maybe some shame that comes up for you. And you say to yourself, well, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have drank that much or ate that much, or I shouldn't have spent that much money. And maybe I should have rather rested a bit more, or I should have, you know, spent time, quality time with family and, and maybe connecting a little bit more. So today isn't about beating ourselves up. It's just bringing awareness to what's coming. And if we can be well prepared and maybe be more intentional and a bit of planning, then we I'm guaranteed, not will guarantee, that your January would, would uh, most probably look a lot different than what it may be used to in the past. So what is this overconsumption? I think for all of us, we have to go and sit down and sort of figure that out for ourselves. But just the general definition of it is in excess, it's too much, it's excessive. And it sometimes can lead to harm and it can sometimes lead to us, um, I think, you know, um, having negative consequences because of those things that we did um, over that period. Now, it can happen in a lot of areas. I've mentioned a couple of them. It can happen with food, with alcohol, with spending, with shopping. We can also be a bit more stressed than normal because we wanting to uh, meet everyone's expectations. We want to please everyone. We want to be at everyone's parties. We want to uh, be with all family on Christmas Day. And that creates a little bit of overwhelm and, and stress for us, which is really so unnecessary. And so we have to go think about what, what is, you know, what is, what is going to make me happy? What is going to make this season most meaningful to me? Now, what drives this overconsumption? And it always comes down to our emotions, because if we believe in this universal truth, if we believe what psychology says, that our actions is driven by our emotions. And behind every emotion is a belief or it's the way that we think about something. So if we get to this festive season and we are in a place where we feel maybe discomfort, we feel this contracted, like closed feeling that we have results that we don't want, then we know it's always a, an emotion behind it. And behind that, it's what we think or what we tell ourselves. Now, I want to give you four Ps to this morning that you can keep in mind to be a little bit more mindful over this festive period. Now, the first one that comes up is purpose. So think about what do you want for this festive season? How do you want to show up? 
And what is your values? What's most important to you? How do you want to spend your time? So, for instance, if physical health is important, if maybe financial health and maybe family is your top priorities or top values, then it's going to be so much easier to make decisions um, around what invites you accept and what you do with your time and your money. The second P is planning. So obviously, when we know what we want, we can go ahead and plan. And it doesn't mean that we have to plan everything to the T, but just have a general idea. Just put some ideas on paper about what I'm planning, what I want to do, and how I want to spend my time. Then the second one is pause. So when we're in that place where we maybe are in doubt, we don't know what to do, we've got this closed, contracted feeling, pause for a moment, just ask ourselves, why? Why am I feeling this? What is causing this? And then lastly, to produce those emotions that I desire the most. So if through this festive season, I'm after more abundance, more joy, love, connection, then I know that buying something or maybe spending time with a specific person isn't necessarily going to give me that abundance or joy or love. It's by what I tell myself. So if I tell myself that I'm abundant, that I have enough, that I can create all the emotions for myself, I don't need to rely on external things. And when those external things then happen in my life, for sure, then I'm going to enjoy it that much more. And uh, I'm going to appreciate it so much more. And I won't be in a position where I want to overconsume to feel a certain way. So that's what I have for you today. Think about what this festive season wants to, what, what do you want it to look like for you? And then what do you need to think well, how do you want to feel throughout this period? And then go create it in your mind first, and then guaranteed you won't be overconsuming. So thank you, and I'll be back next week. I think nothing beats or like, I don't know, like, you know, being here live, so presenting live and you being here live. I don't think there's many different things that beats that. Thank you very much, Norma. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, if you go back and see everything that Norma has done. So she joined season two. And uh, so it's her third season and how far uh, we've come. But not just that, uh, also what she has shared uh, over these last three years has been absolutely incredible. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that, Norma. Righty, next up we have Gugu with her special guest. And uh, we are back with Why to Connect. And today um, she is chatting to her guest about niching. So an interesting topic again today. Something that came up in the week in a session that I was part of. So we're uh, looking forward to this one. Thank you so much, Francois. Good morning, everybody, and good morning to Wotlali. Um, Wotlali Tsitlo is a trichologist who specializes in African textured hair. Uh, she has 10 years experience in the hair care industry, and she manufactures hair care brands. She's established the first no heat, no comb natural hair salon in the country. And this year, she opened a trichology clinic. Now, interestingly, Wotlali um, has a finance background, so she's got a BCom economics degree, and that's actually how we met. And she's worked as a fixed income dealer for the South African Reserve Bank, and she later joined the stockbroking business, um, a stockbroking business in their research sales team. Morning, Butale. How are you doing today? Morning. Well, thank you. And you? Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. Now, um, as financial planners, we are encouraged to have a niche, right? So by focusing on a particular niche, we can then develop a deep understanding of that specific, um, of the financial needs of that specific niche, um, allowing us to become experts in that area to better provide um, a, a better service. Um, and, and I'd like to find out from you, you've managed to do that quite successfully, right? You, you focus on a very specific niche. Please talk us through why you decided to work only with natural or unprocessed hair versus being a generalist in in the African hair business and what that means exactly for those who don't know. Okay, so it really started with the essence of what I wanted to do and um, so the why of the business and that was celebrating our hair in its natural beauty and that defined how we did things because in 
celebrating their beauty, it meant not doing things that damage the hair. So then it eliminated a whole lot of things like combing, like blow, blow drying by um, adding extensions and using dye. So that that then became, and that's why we've been consistent because we always go back to why, why are we doing this? And mm -hmm. it's, that, that's an anchor of what we do. So anything that really deviates from the beauty of, of our natural hair, then um, we don't do. Interesting. So um, some would say, I mean, this this happens quite a lot in our industry. Some would say that having a very narrow niche could be bad for business. Um, what has been the benefit for your business being so specific in, in the service that you offer? Because I'm sure you get a lot of pushback um, from, from your clients when it comes to, you know, the, the dyeing and using hair extensions and things like that. Yeah, being niche really improves our efficiencies. Um, and, and in a previous business, that was the biggest lesson I learned that you can't sort of trying to be a generalist um, really deviates from um, also finding your tribe. Um, I always compare being an entrepreneur to sort of designing your own car, right? So as an entrepreneur, you decide what type of car you want to um, design, what type of people you want to come into the car, and also the destination and the, the route you're going to take. So example being a farmer you know um, you need something big and a big bucky and robust so you can't sort of drive through um, a gravel road at 160 kilometers uh, with a sedan and and being niche really gives you that it's you know do you want to take the scenic route do you want to take you know go off road and that's what it does and then you build your systems around that and that's what we've been able to do because working around uh, natural hair, you only need a certain amount of time. So we're then able to uh, give our clients that efficiency. Um, and then you build the conveniences around this particular niche business. Interesting. Um, uh, you then ventured into trichology and, and that came from your hair care business. Can you talk us through a little bit about that? Yeah, so because our why is really about the beauty and health of hair, um, we were seeing quite a lot of hair and scalp issues and it always sort of tell our clients, you know, go see a dermatologist. And we also needed to sort of have a sense of what we're seeing. Uh, and that's why I ventured into trichology, which is the uh, study of the scalp and hair. Um, mm -hmm. So we then able to um, integrate that into the business. So in achieving our client's healthiest hair, it means we are doing the right things and we can identify. Uh, and sometimes before the clients can, because they aren't mm -hmm. able to see the back of the heads and then be able to see those parts of the, the heads and the scalp properly and we can guide them and provide better treatments and products for them. Stunning. Interesting. My final question to you. I have noticed because um, I, I do send my daughter to your salon quite often. I have noticed that there's now quite a number of salons claiming to, to do what you do. So they have similar payoff lines. I know that I've seen that in the past as well. Has that been an issue for you and how have you managed to handle that? Yeah, well, those actually trademarked us, so, so I need to go send my lawyers to them. Um, but from year one, I knew that the landscape is going to change. You know, we were the, I mean, I say we're the first, I know he'd not come in the country, but I think we actually in the world, there was this, at, in 2016, there was no other mm -hmm. salon doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just a matter of time before people sort of go in into the same space. But for me, what, it, what it's meant is, by starting that category, we we actually became the category leader, but also it really enhances our why is our whole aim was to see more of us enjoying our hair and it's beautiful mm -hmm. uh, state, right? So when there are more people entering this um, category, it means more people are actually uh, doing exactly what we, we strive to do. Yeah, nice. so that's Thank uh, you so much. Goodness, yeah. Stunning. Thank you so much, Michele. Thank you so much for joining us today. And that's it from us. Back to you, Francois. Thank you. I just love stories like this. Absolutely well done. And uh, thank you very much, Kuku. But Lale, thank you so much and for sharing your story and your journey with us. Really appreciate it. And uh, we wish you well and uh, keep going. It's really, uh, these are the stories that South Africa is made of. So I really, really like that. 
uh, when people go after things where they see, oh, there's an opportunity or they have a passion or there's something that drives them and they go after it without stopping. So really love that. Anyways, next up, uh, some quick announcements. Alrighty, so let me just get up my screen here because I've been all over the, the show this morning, literally, uh, to, to sort of just get to everything that's still happening on my side of the world. But uh, with that, uh, the very first one, obviously, that I would like to talk about would be uh, that uh, if you haven't subscribed yet to this channel, uh, we would really love for you to do so. Uh, you know, it does help us grow the channel. It helps us get more guests and uh, so on. So uh, it does help us really when we're talking to people say, oh, we would like to have you as a guest. You know, some of them are very cognizant of how many subscribers you have and all of these weird and wonderful things, although that's never been my my main reason, but it will really, really help if you can help us out uh, in that sense. And as I said, please hit that like button if you're getting value and uh, do share these episodes. It's easy to share uh, any episode or any video on YouTube. Please share that with your teams or with your friends and your colleagues uh, that can really benefit from this. So really appreciate that. All righty, so into the uh, announcements, let's talk a little bit about uh, starting 2024, February. I'm just going to mention something small. We're going to do it properly. And there's two things that's happening in February. Um, the one thing I'm not going to share with you, I'm going to share it at the Connect event uh, today. Uh, but the big one for me that we are launching in February is our brand new program called Professional Practice. Uh, and it's called Professional Practice 10.0 because I felt like we don't want to do 2.0, 3.0. That's not raising the bar. We want to go 10.0. So uh, we have created this program. Uh, it's Adam and myself. So we have put together something that's very practical, very focused, and it's going to be available to all our members at no additional charge. How amazing is that? So all you need to do is to become a member if you want access to this. So I'm going to share more about this at the event today and at all the Connect events uh, for that matter. And we're getting into value propositions, we're getting into marketing, we're getting into connections, we're getting into client experience, as well as structuring your business uh, as well. So it's going to be a very powerful hands-on course, and it's a live course. So it's not like pre, some of the stuff is pre-recorded, so there's some pre-work, but then we have live sessions, et cetera, where we can really help you uh, do the things. And the other beauty about it is that you can jump in at any point, so you don't have to go through the entire process. We've actually structured it as five separate courses in the series so that you can jump in with anything that you may need at this point in time in your business. So really looking forward to that. So that's launching February 2024. And uh, the next up, obviously, is today's event. So after this, I'm rushing to Pretoria. So uh, our next Connect event last week was really a big uh, success. So a uh, big thank you to Independent Investment Solutions for sponsoring the venues for us and also for Razan and Profile Me. You made a, a significant contribution to help us cover uh, some of the additional costs and uh, for the for those that are attending that also voluntarily contributed thank you very much uh, we almost covered all the costs so it's been amazing so thank you very much uh, for that um, so today we have you anita foster as my guest uh, finding passion courage and energy in a world of overwhelm so looking forward to chatting to her in person uh, also so norma is going to be there in person uh, we've got Andrew Crawford there in person today, and we also have Steph Leroux with us today in person, and obviously 30 other amazing financial planning professionals who are joining us for this event. All the events are now sort of sold out apart from Durban. Um, Durban and still have three seats available, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but Joburg was full, Pretoria is full, Cape Town is full, so thank you very much uh, for that. Talking about Durban, next week I have uh, Mandy Murphy, or not next week, on the 24th of November rather, if you're not confused anyone, we're going to talk about punch uh, above your weight, so looking forward to that one, and then Rob McDonald is going to be in person in Cape Town, so how amazing is it, right? So you get to see him today here, and then uh, for those of you going to Cape Town, you're going to see him in person, we're going to have a different conversation in, in Cape Town than we have this morning, so really looking forward to also uh, having him there in person. So thank you in advance, Rob. I uh, really appreciate that. Then uh, this week on Microsoft 365, we spoke all about data and uh, we got into Microsoft lists and Power BI and Power Query. And it's amazing what you can do. Very Just doing simple things and uh, really getting the most out of Microsoft 365 that you're already paying for. 
And uh, so it's an incredible journey. Next week, we are talking about security, and that's going to be the last module in the series. So uh, then we will start looking at what we are doing next year to build on those on those skills. Uh, and all of these things are available to Propulsion members uh, at no, no additional charge. So uh, all you need to do is become a member, uh, pay your monthly subs, and you have got access to all of this stuff. Then financial planning tools and techniques was also fantastic this, this week uh, that, that uh, we, we, we had the session yesterday, and it was an incredible deep session. It was probably the best one that we've done this year. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It was a real uh, personal conversation as well uh, between uh, Steve Martin, myself, and Adam uh, which was powerful. And then next week, uh, we are talking about what do you do when clients, uh, when a client's train of thought is all over the place? So how do we help the client find order uh, from chaos? And really looking forward to that. And uh, so if you're not, uh, if you're in the community, but you're not part of that program, definitely something to go check in. All the recordings are there for the previous modules as well. So you've got full access to that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a one minute and 15 seconds over my time. Can't wait to chat to Rob next. And uh, thank you very much again for being here. And uh, please engage in the chat. Say hi to everybody. Uh, please ask questions to Rob and uh, I will relate him to him. But uh, let's head on over and chat to Rob. Mr. Rob McDonald, warm welcome to Propulsion. Thanks very much, Francois. It's great to be here. Morning to you and to everyone here online. Um, Rob, yeah, it's been really an incredible uh, thing for me to get to actually know you. I mean, I've known of you for so many years. Never had the opportunity to meet, never had the opportunity to sort of engage. And then uh, I called you up out of the blue uh, and asked if you'll be part of our summit, Ascend. And you said yes. And sort of that's where we started uh, engaging a little bit. And then the book came out and I sort of asked, you, can we talk about this and all of it? And I was um, lucky enough to be at your at your book launch and massive congratulations. Um, I can see the work that has gone into this and just all the years of experience, um, you know, and, and when we, we when we chatted, I was going like, I, I, I had in my mind sort of you doing one thing. And then you said to me, yeah, I do all that stuff, but my passion, my passion is really this stuff. So uh, warm welcome. Thank you very much. I really look forward to to this conversation. Great. Thanks very much, Francois. Thank you. All right. So, um, Rob, just maybe for if there are people who are not 100% sure, like Rob McDonald, seen you write a lot for Blue Chip uh, is where I see a lot of your content. People that have gone through the Fund House sort of program with Alan Gray uh, in, in past years must know you. Um, but probably there's some people who are not 100% not sure who Rob is and what Rob does. Uh, if that's even possible in my mind, uh, yeah. but maybe just a brief, just just uh, just very briefly, uh, you know, what you what do you do every day, and then uh, we'll get into the conversation. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Francois. I mean, I think um, um, what do I do? Um, I I think I work primarily with financial planners and and some asset management businesses, um, and I my work is really, I suppose, in a sense, um, threefold. I do some consulting work. Um, uh, I do some coaching work and I do some training work. Um, and uh, and the training that I do with financial planners generally is in sort of two streams. The one is um, around practice management. Um, and, and I think that's how we first started engaging Francois. And then the other stream, which is, is, is where my real passion lies, because I think this is where the future of financial planning lies, is, is around um, the human side of financial advice. Um, and so I do a lot of work with financial planners around how they engage um, on the human side of advice with their clients uh, and, um, and developing skills in that area. Because I think the, the profession has focused very rightly so very much on technical skills and being able to be in a position to give good sound technical advice. Um, but I think um, with the evolution of technology um, uh, we are needing to find new ways to add value to clients. And I think that um, it's being able to engage with your client as a human being, as a whole human being, and being able to help them navigate their lives um, and their money um, in, in the most optimal way possible, I think is the challenge that uh, financial planners are going to face going forward. 
Yeah, and I see this everywhere, right? And and uh, I mean, particularly one of the things I probably want to want to start off with, Rob, before I even get into a little bit of the book, I just want to delve into. Uh, I in the beginning talked about the seven C's, etc. So it's not the the Pet Shop Boys song. Uh, you know, it is it is like there are seven C's in your book that you yeah. sort of say, well, if clients can 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 learn these skills and follow that, they will be successful. Uh, but the book is just as much aimed at financial planners, so we know how to sort of help with that uh, with our clients. But before we get into that, I want to ask you, you know, what are the things that young financial planners are really, really struggling with at the moment when they come into the profession um, is that they, and depending on, I, I believe, where they land up, so the environment in which they find themselves. So whether they go to to more of a product house versus more of a completely independent fee-based maybe on the one hand, not, not that... I think this whole fee discussion, um, it's part of it, but it's not not the main thing that we need to be worried about at this point. I want to know, like, from your perspective, is they're finding it very hard to get into, uh, to build a client base, and they are under pressure. And particularly if they work on commission only, like most, like the majority of people uh, start off like that. Mm-hmm. They want to do the right thing. They want to engage around, focus on the client, all of those things. But it takes additional time and they sort of find it difficult. So is there, like, what is your view on that? What would be maybe, I don't know, just your thoughts or your advice on if somebody was starting off today uh, or maybe they've been around for less than two years or something like that, you know, and you want to focus on this because I believe in this stuff and we preach this stuff, but they find it very hard to actually do it with clients because they need to be on to the next one. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're highlighting there, Francois, is actually a huge challenge for the profession as a whole. I mean, in fact, in my, the subtitle of my book is actually partnering with a professional to thrive. And, 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 a, and a sort of a theme in the book is that, yes, these seven C's are very important for clients to develop the skills, but also for financial planners to develop the skills. But I also say, importantly, that that ideally you work with a professional um, to achieve your financial health. And, and I think, Francois, the challenge here is what is a professional? Um, and, and I think where we're getting things wrong is, is expecting a young person to come into the profession and to build a book. Um, you don't see this happening in an accounting profession or a legal profession. Young people come in and do their articles and work hard and are mentored and guided by older professionals. And the partners in the firm are the people who bring the clients in. There's no ways that you would expect a young lawyer or a young accountant to go out and look for clients. They, they've got to learn the trade in a sense. Um, and so I think that's where we get it wrong. So my, my, my observation would be, uh, in response to your question, is that ideally a young person would be wanting to find a home where, where that is the perspective that that business takes. In other words, that you know the, the people who bring in the business are the people who are experienced, have been around for a while, and, and, and that they are mentoring and, and guiding and teaching the younger people. Um, and, and there are more and more financial planning businesses who are set up like this, who pay their, their, their staff members and their, and their advisors salaries. Um, and, and that the, 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 the need to grow the business, grow the book, falls upon the senior people in the business. Um, and I, and I, I, I always do scratch my head when I, when I hear um, you know, older advisors saying they want to bring in a younger advisor as succession, um, but but that person must build their own book. You know, it's crazy. You, you know, you, you you built a book, bring somebody in to help you service the book and teach them how to do it, pay them a salary, uh, and that's how I believe um, the profession needs to evolve. If we if we're going to be a true profession, um, and and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole that we went down on Wednesday night. But you know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so it, it is an. Uh, I mean, it's a brilliant. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not just a brilliant answer. It's obviously it is exactly that. Um, is the way that that so, and that's why I believe it's so. You know, when you want to join the profession, you financial planning is a passion for you because I've also heard stats that really like blew my mind. Or not stats. It's not like physical research that was done, but it mm-hmm. was. Out of a group of 17 people who studied their postgrad financial planning and became CFPs, only two are still in practice. Mm-hmm. And I'm talk- talking about people like me who did it way back. I'm talking about somebody who did it recently. And that is a massive problem for us to say, well, we've got people who we want in the in the profession, but they mm-hmm. don't make it because we don't create the environment. 
And even if we bring them in, we're not looking after them properly always like the way maybe we intended to because of uh, I mean, many factors, I would say. Mm -hmm. But it's such an important thing for us to address. And the reason why I asked this question, uh, even though I'm going to talk about your book now, is the fact that I want everybody to be aware of this massive problem that we're sitting with. And we all can play a little part to try and alleviate this and make it better for the youngsters, but really integrate them, really bring them in. And it's not going to be possible and feasible for everybody, I guess. Um, so, you know, so so those businesses and practices who are able to do that and do things differently, um, you know, I really want to 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 sort of say, please <laughs> think about yeah. this for next year's strategy. It's so important. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I agree with you, Francois. It's a huge issue. And my encouragement is is to to try and shift the, the thinking away from the need, this income generation need, that this expectation that somebody's got to sort of, in a sense, pay for themselves and really to shift that. Because, you know, if you're thinking, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, then, you know, paying somebody 10 or 15,000 rand a month for the first year or two of their working life, where they, you know, where they're not worried about having to bring in business, but what their job is, is to learn the business. Um, you know, the payoff down the line for your business will be huge. Um, and so it's, it's, it's trying to just, I think, shift the mindset. And I, and I think uh, it's, it's tough because many financial planners sort of feel like they built their book. They built their business like this. Therefore, somebody coming in needs to do this, do it that way. And, and it just doesn't work like that anymore. You know, we, we, we really got to, I, I think it's, and I see somebody has said there that succession is the biggest challenge we face the profession. The only way to solve this problem is to, I think, shift our, our approach. We, you know, um, you, you've heard that story about, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. It, it doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And um, there was actually something else that I was thinking about now, but um, it has escaped me now in a second. But anyway, so, um, Rob, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, let, let's go, let, let's step onto the book. Um, but thanks very much for that, because I think it's such an important issue that we can actually explore more um, later on. And if we can just create awareness around this, uh, you know, it'll help so much uh, to help the younger people, the ones that we want to uh, to, to succeed and to come through. Uh, it's it's just such a critical thing for me suddenly. Since I heard that, I just can't stop thinking about it. So so thank you very yeah. much for that. I mean, I mean, right. maybe, sorry, Francois, can I add one yeah. comment? Please, <laughs> just because, please. Um, you know, I just see another comment. Uh, I think it might be Dirk who's, who's commenting. But, but the, it's you great, know, I yeah. think that the, the key is that um, is, is and the other shift is to how you look at your business, you know. And so... You know, I think where, where financial planning businesses are different from other businesses is that people have been able to build a business without having to put capital into it, if that makes sense. So you go into the business and you immediately are able to generate revenue and bring in uh, revenue and build value um, for yourself in your business. Whereas most other businesses require capital upfront, require an investment where you've got to, you know, buy the plant and machinery or whatever it might be. To be able to build the widgets that you're going to sell, and so the, the the other mindset shift is to see your 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 practice as a business building value that stands alone, separate from you. And then, for example, you know where the shareholding. I see Dirk talking about shareholding. There is, you know, people would have to then buy into that business and buy into the shareholding. Um, but you can't expect somebody to buy shareholding and then not and then still expect them to build their own book. That that doesn't make sense. So. So if you treat it as having people who are employees working in your business, um, and then over time, they uh, basically earn the right to, to, to get ownership and that, and you can work out how to, to, that can be done. You know, there are many different ways. And also, that's also a big challenge in financial planning business space at the moment is how do you, how do you get ownership into the hands of younger um, advisors in, in your business? Um, but uh, the key point is, is that you want them to be part of your business and not building their own little book in your business. And, and I think that's a, a key issue. Yeah, it feels to me like that's been the traditional way of doing it, right? So that's the way you earn your stripes, etc. And I think back to the days when I started as a broker consultant, you know, they wouldn't let me out of the door uh, to do anything <clears throat> apart from maybe being a skivvy to the senior consultants. But um, for six months, at the very least, I had to do back office work and sort of work in the servicing areas and, and deal mm -hmm. with all of those things before they let me see an advisor. 
-hmm. But yet we employ new people and we want them to go see clients immediately and dispense financial advice just because they've got to build a book. Uh, we're talking mm -hmm. like everybody's doing this. It's not the case. There are some businesses who have fantastic programs and things like that that are really mm -hmm. addressing this issue. Uh, but it's so small still. Like we we need more people to do that. And one thing I want to add before we step off to to, to the book, Rob, is that I, I do believe that we should stop being romantic and um, you know sort of emotionally attached to our businesses. I'm not saying don't have passion. I'm not saying don't 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 be don't love your business. That's not what I'm saying. But we should stop thinking with our hearts when it comes to making these decisions. It's a business decision. It's a long-term benefit to, to the client. And if it's all about the client, we will do the right decisions. It's not about I built this from scratch and I did all of these things, um, you know, versus uh, mm -hmm. now this person just comes in and just benefits from all my hard work. And so it's, it's a mindset thing. It's like everything in life starts with mindset and how we – the meaning that we assign to things as well. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so it and is. It's also, it's yeah, yeah. And Francois, it's also, I think, the, the recognizing that within a, a business, a firm, practice, whatever you want to call it, that there are different roles, you know, and, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with Michael Gerber's um, E-Myth, um, where he talks about the three roles that people can play in a, in a business. And, and most often, when you start a financial planning business, you start in the role of technician, which is you're doing the work, you're giving the advice, you, you're doing all the hard yards. Um, but he talks about the fact that the problem with most businesses, even non-financial planning businesses, is that people don't go beyond the technician role. They think it's all about being a technician. And in fact, what's needed is to think like a manager is the next level. So think about how is this business managed? But then very importantly, the third level is to think like an owner and to have those different hats on. Uh, and, and so I think that's one way that maybe people can start thinking about it is what decisions would I make for my practice as an owner trying to build value versus um, as a technician trying to do good financial advice. Um, and if we can sort of encourage people to wear different hats, it'll, it'll potentially lead to different decisions. Um, because if you're thinking about your business from a technician perspective, you've got a very different perspective than if you're thinking about it as a shareholder and owner of a business. And so the same applies to the younger people coming in is actually, you know what, you're starting life here as a technician, you're going to do some good work. Maybe you're going to start as a para planner. Then you're going to end up as an advisor. And then over time, if you want to, maybe there's a role in management and potentially even opportunity to buy shareholding. So I think it's about splitting up those sort of three very basic roles that, that, that all businesses have, uh, both in financial planning and outside of it. Um, and then maybe just to address Tanya's question very quickly, Tanya, we have to get into that. We have to adopt the practice that people get paid a salary for work that they do, and and that's the key. Uh, I mean, uh, that, uh, yeah, that, that, so that's how you get young advisors to enter. Um, because yeah. as, to your point, Francois, people go away, they do a university degree in financial planning now, they do their postgraduate diploma, and, and then they go out and now they've suddenly got to sell for commission. No wonder they're only two out of 17 who's still in practice, because they want to be professionals, they want to give advice. I mean, imagine if you went to the doctor and they were compensated for how much medicine that they prescribed. That was their remuneration model. You wouldn't want to go and see that doctor. You'd want to go and see the doctor who is paid to give you advice. Yeah. Sorry, you, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm getting onto my hobby horse here, Ron, so I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, uh, we are, uh, I've obviously derailed this entire conversation uh, by asking that first question. So uh, I'm, I'm standing here thinking, okay, so should I rename this episode and then <laughs> do one on the book as well? Um, but, uh, but important. But, but let's stand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the human side of things. I mean, a, a lot of people on the call today, really love uh you know that is a big passion of theirs and it's a big focus of theirs uh it's a big part of lifestyle financial planning it's a big part of um you know many things coaching etc that that people employ different uh skills and and things so there's a couple of things that i picked out from your book that i just want to talk a, a little bit about so we're going to touch on all seven of the c's uh, but we are there's there's, there's three specific and uh, depending on the time we'll, we'll see how far we get but I think one of the biggest things is, and it's something that I struggled with in my business, I struggled with it in my life first, like it was a big thing for me back in 2014, 2015, um, spent a lot of time on this kind of stuff. And you still, it feels to me, I don't know if you ever know, but it's this, this, this issue around having clarity, you know, being very clear on what it is you want to do or what you want to achieve, the kind of life that you, that you want to live. Um, 
-hmm. it feels to me like it's very important. Um, is it very important? I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's critical, um, um, Francois, and I, and I think in, in, from, a, from the perspective that I put talk about it in the book, I think there's clarity needed in, in, in two places. One is, I think, um, financial planners need to have clarity about what their role is. Um, and you spoke earlier about value proposition. Um, and, 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 and so the, for me, the starting point is, as a financial planner, am I clear about what my role is um, and what I'm really here to do with clients? And if I do have that clarity, then I'm well positioned to help clients find clarity. Um, and so I think the so for me, um, I think that we can distill financial planning down to a very simple definition of saying that financial planning is about helping clients make choices or decisions about their money and their life, and then implementing those decisions. And I think that's a key point there that we help them make the choice, and then we help them implement that choice. So if, if, if as long as I'm clear on my role as a financial planner, and you'll hear there that I've said nothing about product, and I've said nothing about selling, I'm helping somebody make choices about their life and their money and helping them implement it. And I, and I think it's important to say that it's about life and money um, because clients need clarity about their life and money. Um, and I'm sure that everybody on this call will know clients who maybe have got lots of money but are not that happy in life or who have don't have much money and are very happy in life. And it's a bit of a contradiction. Um, the point being is, is how do we help people have both. How do we help them? And that's what I refer to as financial health. Have a balance between being satisfied with their life and their money. And 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 so to be able that for that to happen, I think people have to have clarity in what they want out of their lives, even before you talk about their money. Um, sometimes, obviously, uh, the, the reverse happens and you talk about money first. But I think the reality is, is that clients need to have clarity on their life um, in order to be able to make their money work for them. Otherwise, we just get into the conversation about, you know, what should we do with this money you've just inherited? Or what should we do with your RA investments? And that's the conversation. That's not helping the client get clarity. So absolutely, um, for me, the, the starting point, but the ongoing work of a financial planner is helping clients get clarity. And I'm sure, I'm sure that financial planners on the call would agree that, that there are often clients who don't really know what they want. And so what ends up happening is that the financial advisor almost tells them what they think they should want. Um, and I think that's where uh, potentially we can do better for clients, that we can help clients find clarity around what they're wanting out of their life and their money. And sometimes it's, you know, oh, let me not say that. Let me not ask it this way, Rob. <clears throat> so if if we want to help clients uh, gain clarity, because I think most people probably, it's just a big assumption that they probably don't have clarity or maybe they even think that it's one thing, but it's actually maybe another. Mm -hmm. But how important is, and this probably links a little bit to the next C that I want to talk about, which is curiosity. Mm -hmm. But if we want to help people with their clarity, how important is it for us to understand the backstory and their money stories and sort of, you know, uh, their relationship with money and all of those things. So now you, you told a couple of very powerful stories on Wednesday night around this specific issue. So, yeah. so the question is, can I help a client obtain clarity just going through a process and say, oh, we do X, Y, and Z, and there's the Lego that you just built? Uh, or how important <laughs> is it that backstory? Yeah. I mean, I think that if you, if you ask how do you help clients get clarity, I mean, I, I think – uh, and this is a lot of the work that I do is is working with financial planners to to adopt what I call a coaching way of being or a, or a coaching approach to how they engage with clients. And 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 if one looks at what does that mean? Well, if we look at the pure definition of a coach in in a personal sense, I'm not talking about the sports coach, but I will talk a bit about that now. But if a, you know, a personal coach is somebody who helps a a person or a client find their own answers to their own questions that they have. Um, and so in a sense, when we talk about curiosity, absolutely as a financial planner, you want to be curious about your client's life 
and what they're trying to get out of it. But in many ways, you're also trying to foster the curiosity of the client. Because very often clients haven't ever had that chance to think about their own life. And if we just talk to them about their money, then they don't get the opportunity. Because I think that that's where financial planners are so privileged and an incredibly um, powerful role that you can play in people's lives. If you can stimulate the curiosity in your client's life about their own life. And so how do we get help clients get clarity? Well, we, we, we get them to ask them questions about their lives themselves. And so obviously that requires a skill. Um, and that skill is what I talk about in, in terms of this adopting a, a coaching way of being. But the skill is largely about accepting that every client that you have, um, first of all, knows something that you don't know. Um, but more importantly, I like to call them that they are the expert in their lives. And so you want to tap into their expertise about their life and help them with it. Sometimes, sometimes they need help with that, but, but, but they know their life better than you do or anybody else does. But very often they haven't had the chance to reflect on it, to think about it, to share. And so, so my encouragement is, to, and to talk about it in the book, is that you know, through curiosity and, 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 um, and how, do we, how do we show curiosity? One, we need to be genuinely interested in the client. That's obviously important. Um, uh, but the second is to tap into curiosity. The very simple thing we want to do is just to ask questions. And um, Michael Bunga Stania, who, who, who wrote, uh, wrote a book called The Coaching Habit and has got a great TED talk about how to tame your advice monster, talks about the question that the, 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 the point that questions are the kindling of curiosity. So how do, we, how do we help clients get clarity? We ask them questions that are going to help them find answers for themselves about their own lives. Really love that, Rob. Um, it, and it's, so, it's such a powerful thing, um, you know, if we can, we can get all of this right um, with our clients. But also we need to understand, you know, it's a journey, right? It's not a one meeting process. Mm -hmm. that, that's the biggest thing. And I think that's the biggest mm -hmm. shift Probably if you really start focusing on a client, you really want to connect, you really want to understand, you really want to delve deep. It is about, uh, you know, spending more time with them uh, and, and sort of taking them on a journey rather than having uh, a six step financial planning process. This is a massive thing that almost I think proceeds and is interweaved into a lot of those, those things probably. Yeah. One yeah. thing that is, one thing that's very important, Rob, is, uh, you know, client engagement from, from that point of view. So, you know, when I when I refer sort of to client engagement, what I talk about is where the client is really present in the meeting. There's a meeting of minds. They they they're expending energy. They're not just sitting there listening and counting down the minutes for for this meeting to end. Whether they write with us or whether they 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 actively ask questions and they think and they they're really present. Um, so the other C that you talk about, well, one of the where other C's is collaboration. Talk a little bit through through that, and why is it important, and what role does it play, and how can we how can we as planners uh, foster that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, so. One of the things I talk about in the book, and going back to the sporting analogy, is I talk about the fact that um, if you if you think about tennis, and you think about a guy like Novak Djokovic, um, he's thirty six years old. Um, he's got won 24 Grand Slams. I mean, he's the he's been number one for I think the, now the 400 weeks, um, and and yet he has a coach. Um, he 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 doesn't he doesn't presume that he can do all of that on his own because we all have blind spots and we we all need feedback on on you know what we are doing right wrong what we're missing what we haven't seen etc. Uh, and and uh, in contrast to Djokovic. You, you've probably all heard of a guy named Nick Kyrgios, who is certainly, um, by all accounts, the most talented tennis player in the world. He's got loads more talent than Djokovic, in my opinion. But he's never won a singles Grand Slam. And he never will win one because he doesn't have a coach. And he's unlikely to ever get a coach because of just the persona that he is. And so what does that talk to? It talks to the power of collaboration. That, that we we can't we can't know everything about ourselves ourselves we need to have a mirror put up for us to enable us to see where the, the blind spots are um, to see where the patterns are the repeated bad behavior like spending too much money repeatedly 
if I don't get somebody to put the mirror up and say, hey, Rob, it looks like you are you know, spending too much money. What do, you, what do you think you should do about it? Not, I think you should stop spending money. It's putting it back onto me. So the whole point about collaboration is saying, I'm going to work with you, but you are the master of your own destiny. And, and that's the key here. And I think that's where sometimes we go wrong with financial advice. Our client is the master of their own lives. We want to help them live their life as fully as possible. So therefore, we're going to collaborate. We're going to push back at them. We're going to challenge them. We're going to ask them to do stuff that they might not have thought about. I mean, just one, one quick story around this is, is you know, and, and I do talk about in the book, you know, a financial planner who shared the story of, of a client who said to him that they wanted uh, more fiscal discipline. Um, and that's a nice, nice way, sort of PC way of saying that I think I'm spending too much money uh, and, and I need to spend less. And so the financial advisor very sort of sensibly said, well, well, maybe you should do a budget. Um, I think you should do a budget. And, and the client said, yeah, that's a good idea. And the financial planner then said, okay, well, um, would you like me to draw the budget up for you? And the client said, yeah, thank you. That'll be great. And so what happened? Six months later, after the client has had this budget drawn up by their financial planner, six months later, the spending habits have not changed at all. The client is now frustrated with the advisor because they came up with the idea of the budget. They drew up the budget. No responsibility or accountability on the part of the client. And the client fired the financial planner. And so what's the point of that story? That wasn't collaboration. Collaboration would have been if the financial planner had said, okay, so you're struggling with fiscal discipline. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about the, 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 the spending habits. And, and uh, Francois, you mentioned the relationship with money earlier in, in our chat. You know, it might be that you want to explore that. You know, tell me more about your relationship with money. What, you know, what do you see the role of money in your life? And so on and so forth. And then to say to the client, what do you think you could do about this? How do you think you could get more fiscal discipline? Because all clients know about the concept of a budget. And they need to articulate it. They need that. In this instance, it would have been much more powerful if the client had said, you know what, I think I probably need a budget. And the financial planner could then have said, that sounds like a good idea. How long do you think it'll take you to put one together? So putting the responsibility back onto the client. And that's the key. And that's the collaboration. Um, because sometimes I think financial planners take too much onto themselves and feel like they've got to do it all for the client and show value to the client. And in, in a sense, um, I think the future is almost about the value, in a sense, is less is more. In other words, all I'm doing in meetings is I'm asking clients questions to get them to think, to get them to talk. And I'm listening and I'm reflecting back so that they can make better decisions um, about their life and their money. Brilliant stuff. Rob, I'm sorry I derailed this conversation, um, but I'm really excited to get deeper into this in Cape Town on the 1st of December. So thank you so very much. Uh, where can people get hold of your book? Um, so they can get it at you know various exclusive books and other bookshops. But I think importantly, there was one question. It has just gone onto Amazon, I think literally yesterday. And then you can also get it, but uh, by, by, you can di buy it directly from the, the publisher um, uh, with free delivery online. It's vindigopress.com. If you go to vindigopress.com, and look for seven pillars of health on that website. You can buy it online and you can um, um, get free delivery. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. I will put the links down below. I haven't yet, but I'll put it on. Um, so if anybody wants to refer back later, you can get it there. Rob, massive thank you. Brilliant uh, discussions that we had this morning, although we went in two different directions and then came back. But thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you for agreeing to this. And I really look forward to seeing you in Cape Town. Yeah, great. I look forward to it too. Thanks very much, Francois, and thanks everybody for being here. Bye bye. Yeah. Cheers. Brilliant stuff. I've got goosebumps. Oh, she was. All right. So next week, my guest is Tian Herschelman, head of advice at Old Mutual Wealth. Tian always brings some interesting discussions. So looking forward to having him back. The last time he was on the show was in season one. So uh, having uh, him back is going to be fantastic. So next week, Tian Herselman, same time, same place. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, be blessed and prosper and uh, continue to raise the ball. Love you. <laughs>